up where we left off last week. We're at Romans chapter 6 at verse 12. Now, verse 12 is a good summary of everything that we've covered so far in chapter 6, verses 1 through 11. So we hear, therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal bodies so that you obey its evil desires. And let's pause and pray. Father, may the word of my mouth, the thought, the meditation, the heart of all here today be acceptable or in the name of Jesus become acceptable. You alone are our strength, our redeemer. Amen. Therefore, obviously ties us back to what has been previously said. Sin here is personified as a person, as an owner, as a master of a slave. And when Paul says, do not let sin reign in your mortal bodies, he is not saying sin is truly dead and cannot reign. He's saying you have a choice. And his imagery, and he'll claim that here later, is of a human origin and it has human limitations, but for our purposes it, it serves pretty good. Consider slave as a sin as the evil slave master. And that we are supposed to, in our minds, think of that evil slave master as having died. But it's not truly dead, and for us, will not be truly dead until we enter eternity. Why? Well, he makes references to our mortal bodies. Do not let sin reign in your mortal bodies. That's why sin still reigns. We, we are in our mortal bodies. 1 Corinthians 15, I think it is 23b, 42b. The body is sown, the body that is sown is perishable. It's talking about a funeral, talking about a grave. The body that is sown, <laughs> that is the body that we put in the ground, is, is perishable. It is raised imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. Now by spiritual body, and this is the danger of the passage, by spiritual body, somebody might think of the false religion known as Gnosticism. Gnosticism, that word means secret knowledge. Gnosticism was the belief that you have to have the secret knowledge in order to be saved. You still see effects of that in the groups within the body of Christ that say we're the only ones that have it right. We're the only ones that, that really are Christian. But, but a key component of Gnosticism is this idea that the human body is bad and that uh, the, the, the more we cut our ties to the human body, uh, the better off we'll be. You see Gnosticism still in Christian worship when you see, sing songs like, I'll fly away, O glory. That's a very f famous Gnostic hymn. I'll fly away, O glory. I, you know, one glad morning, you know, I'll fly away. It's just this idea that I'm going to leave all the physicality behind. What does Paul mean by a spiritual body? Whatever Jesus was at the day of the resurrection forward, that's what we'll be. Think of what Jesus, according to the, the four Gospels, he would walk through a wall, he would suddenly appear or disappear. All that's keeping with Gnostic thought. But then you could touch him, and that really blows their minds. You could feel the imprint of the nails. You could reach into the side where the sword pierced. You could uh, watch him eat fish. Uh, you know, you could see him break bread. All of that is physicality, but it's not the physicality of what we would call our mortal flesh. It is the glorified body that Paul will refer to as being without spot or wrinkle. It's, it's you know, uh, not, let me rephrase. It is more real 
than the reality we think of as being real. Uh, and, and that's the reason it could walk through walls. It was more real, the glorified body was more real than the wall was. And yet when, when he chose to, he could interact with the, the limitation of this world by breaking bread, by eating fish, by uh, breaking, uh, by, by being touched and by touching. And so uh, as he chose to, he could interact within what we call physicality, but it's not Gnosticism. And so uh, therefore, we've got a summary of verses 1 through 11. Do not let sin, again that's personified as a person, as the evil master, do not let sin reign. Reigning is what monarchs do. Reigning is what royalty does. You, uh, you reign as a supreme leader. You reign in your mortal bodies, again because we're in our mortal bodies, so that we do what? So that we obey its evil desires. Sin has evil desires. Um, in, this, in, in this scenario, um, and we're, we're going to catch more of this, but I'll go ahead and introduce this idea. One of the primary sins in my life has always been overeating. And, and yet it's, it's because for me, I know it sounds weird, for me, food stimulates the pleasure and it replaces other things that can stim stimulate the pleasure zones of the brain. Uh, alcohol or drugs might be somebody else's. Uh, any, anything that you can become addicted to, and that includes behavior. I know it sounds strange, but I used to run several times a day. That was when I was in seminary. And how I got through the stress of seminary was I would go to the gym two or three times a day and I would run two or three times a day. And, and the reason that worked is because it triggered a pleasure in my brain. All right, get that idea. Whatever triggers that is, is, is feeding into um, the desire for pleasure. Now, I'm not against, I'm not against exercise in, 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 in its proper place, but it can be overdone. As Paul says elsewhere, uh, physical exercise profits a little. Little translations is it profits little, but he means a little. You know, in his day, you didn't really have to worry about, about getting exercising. Living was exercising. But, it, you know, don't offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness. So looking at my earlier illustration, we're at verse 13. What parts? Well, I don't need to offer my stomach because my stomach sends signals to my brain and the pleasure centers of my brain are stimulated. Likewise drug and alcohol, likewise sexual pleasures, likewise uh, exercise that stimulates, somebody help me, what is it? Endorphins? Endorphins. And, and, and so you get the runner's high, or in my case it was the lifter's high. I was a weightlifter. And that was stimulated. But I don't offer any part. Now, that's the key to this. We can be 90% pure and think, I'm okay. And we compare ourselves with ourselves, and Paul says, we are as unwise. But no part of me is to be offered. And here, instrument of wickedness. Instrument is not like an instrument of war. It's just to be seeing the various parts of our body is various instruments. Our hands are an instrument, our feet are an instrument, our stomach is an instrument. Nothing is to be offered as an instrument of wickedness. One of the biggest ways of, of wickedness is in our brain and it's in our thoughts and in our uh, concepts, minds of reality. And so I have to make sure not to offer my brain to wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought back from death to life. So again, it's a choice. Offer yourself. And again, he said, he continues, offer every 
part of yourself to him, to God, as an instrument of righteousness. So I'm to think of everything that I could have thought of as an instrument for evil, I can now think of as an instrument of goodness. My stomach, my fingers, my hands, my feet, my brain, whatever, my mouth, as an instrument of righteousness. Here later, uh, he'll introduce the idea uh, at 18 that instead of being a slave of sin, we're a slave to righteousness. It blew my mind when I heard Bob Dylan got saved. <laughs> and it especially messed with me when he put out a record of hymns that he wrote. And my favorite is one that's been covered by virtually everybody. You got to serve somebody. And he, he talks about you, you may be uh, an ambassador to England or France. You know, you know, you might like to party, you might like to dance. You may be the heavyweight champion of the world, but he comes down to it. Everybody's got to serve somebody. And, and this idea of instrument of righteousness, this rock and roller, Bob Dylan, becomes a Jesus freak and so really, I mean, it, it, it blew my mind too. I mean, uh, he came to Memphis uh, and participated with, and I, I was at a concert, and it, and this is not the Bob Dylan I grew up with. Yeah. <laughs> What's the matter here? Yeah. But it was really good. It was yeah. really. His, 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 thought, his thought processes were extremely good. I, his voice was still rough, but. Uh, oh, yeah. But that, voice is rough really rough. It's rougher now, but uh, it's rougher now. but I, I was looking it up on YouTube before. I mean, y'all don't really realize how widely I cast the net when I when I research this stuff, and and it's been it's been covered by virtually everybody from Etta James to Willie Nelson and everybody in between, from the old gospel singers to the old country singers to the modern rock and rollers. I, I did post on Facebook uh, my favorite version of it, which was done in a church, but it was done rock and roll fashion, I guess you'd call it, but uh, a lot smoother than Dylan himself. But this is the thought. You're going to serve somebody. But Paul starts with, consider yourself dead to sin. It's not that we are truly dead. When some of us had this concept that when we would come to Christ, we would no longer be tempted. And that proved to be a horrible lie. And, and it caused the downfall of many. And so one of the things that I tell people is, one of the surest ways you know you're saved at the point of conversion, one of the surest ways is if it actually becomes more difficult to live a life of Christ. You can be a good person and not be saved and, 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 and you don't have all that much difficulty. Verse 14, for sin shall no longer be your master. There, there is that idea of the evil slave master. Why? Because you're not under law but under grace. All right, taking that thought, you're not under law un, but under grace, he's circling back to the last verse in the previous chapter and the first verse in this chapter. Uh, verse 21, chapter 5, so that just as sin reigned in death, so also grace might reign through righteousness to bring eternal life through Jesus Christ. So we've got uh, eternal life by grace. Verse six, one, chap, uh, chapter 6, verse 1, what shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning that God's grace may increase? Verse 15, chapter 6, what then shall we sin because we're not under the law but under grace? He circled back around. You remember that, uh, that heresy we talked about last week, that, that the literal translation for it is against the lawism against the lawism, and that is that you have no law, you have no standard because everything is grace. You just get to do whatever you want to, and it's like the fellow that said, uh, I have an agreement with God, he likes to, I like to sin, he likes to forgive. It's known as antinomianism. Antinomianism is this thought that, that there are no standards in life. 
and in, in our denomination, many have accurately accused many, if not all, in our denomination of antinomianism. And as a denomination, that's true. There's no standard. There's anything we have voted in, somebody is ignoring and, and, and doing so without any kind of uh, accountability. Shall we sin because we're not under law but under grace? By no means. And a, again, that is to an extreme. J.B. Phillips earlier translates that as um, uh, what a ghastly thought. What a ghastly thought. By no means. Don't you know that when you offer yourself to someone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one you obey. You may have heard somebody refer to a bad habit and them say when they're challenged on the bad habit, I can quit anytime I want to. And that a lot of times used to be said about smoking. Oh, I can quit whenever I want to. Done it a thousand times. Done it a thousand times. <laughs> you know, and the, and the thing is prove it. And, and here Paul is pointing out it's the obedience that pl proves the slavery. You know, you're obeying. You know, you say you have free will, but the fact that you're obeying the sin proves you don't have free will. Don't you know that if you offer yourselves to someone as obedient slaves, you're a slave to the one you obey, whether you are slaves to sin, which leads to death, or to obedience, which leads to righteousness. Again, we go back to this idea that we're going to serve somebody. Nobody is truly free in the sense that I am an independent agent agent of my own morality. Boy, that just blew some minds. I'm no longer an agent of my own morality. I either serve God or I serve Satan. And there's really no in-between. And so, you're slaves of the one you obey, but thanks be to God that, though you used to be slaves to sin, you have come to obey from your heart. Now, that from your heart is talking about our own free will, our desire. We're now desiring to desire the things of God. Um, Jesus asked the father that had brought the child, do you believe? And the father responded, I believe, help my unbelief. I hear that is, you know, when the child needs healing, uh, Jesus said to the father, do you believe? And uh, I think what he's basically saying there is, I want to believe. And that's, it's the wanting to believe more than the physical, actual obedience that God looks for. Here, he's saying, through your heart. You've come to obey it from your heart. The pattern of teaching that has now claimed your allegiance. There's a process, process there. You've come to obey the pattern of teaching that you claim that has claimed your allegiance. Uh, this pattern of teaching is the gospel. It claims our allegiance, and therefore, from our heart, we're choosing to obey. You've been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. Now, again, that doesn't mean sin is over with. He is saying here, "I'm calling you to this way of life. I'm, I'm wanting this for you." But as long as I'm in my human body, as long as I'm in the flesh, I will still face the battle. But Paul's calling is to, is to consider this. Reckon yourselves dead to sin, he says earlier, I think, verse 11. Nineteen. I'm using an example from everyday life because of your human limitations. Thank you, Paul, he just called us an idiot. No, 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 it's, it's not that. It's, it's that if we see how it happens every day, we can, it's, it's Jesus using the parable. If we see it happening in everyday life, we can understand what's going on. And, and this needs to be a gospel that reaches out even to the youngest child. Y'all realize that tomorrow night, when it comes time for youth, 
I will have taught this lesson three times. And I only teach the big people in order to practice because I have to be able, I do, it's part of my charge. You asked Mr. Wesley what he said about his clergy and their uh, ministry to the children. He was very strict on that. And, and, and so I have to get it sharpened where using human examples, I can, I can bring it down so that even a child can understand it because of human illustrations, everyday life examples. Just as you used to offer yourselves as slaves to impurity and to everlasting wickedness, so now offer yourselves. Now again, it's not once for all, it's on an ongoing basis. There are times that the people at AA and OA talk about white knuckling it through the next moment. I'll, I'll white knuckle it, just you know, go without a drink or without a drug or in my case without a candy bar for the next minute. So now offer yourselves as slaves to righteousness leading to holiness. When you were slaves to sin, you are free from the control of righteousness. Now, he's getting into the idea that you thought you were free when you were a slave to sin. You thought you were free, but that's not true freedom because you really didn't have any choice. You were going to sin. When you were slaves to sin, you were free from the control of righteousness. And so the only freedom we actually had was the freedom from being controlled by righteousness. What benefit did you reap at that time from the things you're now ashamed of? Sermon illustrations. <laughs> Don't do this. I actually had my first real pastor in my life. Uh, the guy that was my pastor from the time I was three until I was, say, 12. Uh, when he saw me the first time, the first day I was a chaplain at the hospital in Memphis, he saw me in the hallway and he said, remember Earl, do as I say, not as I do. You get a lot of good sermon illustrations from that old way of life, but wh wh what, what good was it? So now offer yourselves as slaves to righteousness, when you were slaves to sin, you were free from the control of righteousness. What benefit did, that, did you reap at that time from the things you're now ashamed of? Those things resulted in death. But now that you've been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, notice he's speaking this as if it were already past tense and accomplished, and have become slaves of God, the benefits you reap lead to holiness, and the result is eternal life. One of the things that I posted this morning in my postings, y'all know pastors used to post these things on the door of the church. That's where we used to nail them. Now we put them on Facebook. That's why Martin Luther posted the 95 theses on the Wittenberg Door Church. That's where we used to put our things. Now it's on Facebook. But one of the things that I posted this morning was how John Wesley considered living a holy life was the only way to be truly happy. And, and Wesley repeatedly, over and over again, linked happiness to living holy. That is, to live a godly life. And he would, over and over again, in, in sermons, connect this idea of being happy to holy. What's the benefit do you get? Well, Wesley thought it was, it was this true sense of satisfaction, a, a happiness. What are the benefits? Well, eternal life, but that's only the starting place. It's the security of being firmly in the arms of God and all that that results. 23 is a verse that gets memorized. I've come to discover something. Our children don't know what wages are. They don't. You say the wages. And they'll look at you and it's just blank. They, enough of them, y'all had jobs when you were teen, young teenagers? You went to work probably at home before you did anything and then out. At some point you started getting some sense of money from that. Kids nowadays don't have that. 
and therefore don't understand when we say for the wages of sin is death and therefore it seems like they have no understanding that you do this and you get that Paul used that because even in those days slaves though they might not get, not get salary were oftentimes tipped as, as a way of encouraging certain behavior I've got a, a worker out at the river house and I've tipped him twice and every time it plays with his mind because he knows I'm going to write a check but you know I'll say here uh, let me buy you lunch let me buy you supper and that's to encourage a behavior and so this memory verse really doesn't speak to the kids nowadays for the wages of sin is death and I try to say the result of sin or the payment of sin is death it still doesn't fix you do this and your payment is you die but the gift of God, not a payment, not a salary, a gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. Of course, after taxes are taken out of our wages, you probably only just get a really sick feeling. No, that's not true. Wages are still death. I, I sort of rushed through that one. I'm not so sure why I was fast today. But uh, what are your thoughts and comments? Anybody? I know when I was a kid, I wanted to play baseball on Saturday afternoon. Dad said, okay, you can go play say, baseball, but you find, you can, and I wanted to take the lawnmower down so I could mow the, several of us could mow the field, because it was a, between two signboards. Okay, you can use some, you can go play baseball in the afternoon, and you can take the lawnmower down there, but if you find you jobs between here and the field, and they can buy the gas for it, because I'm not going to buy gas for the lawnmower. You're going to have to figure out how to get gas in that <laughs> Our kids can't do that today. No, they can't. No, they can't. But uh, the old ho whole idea of you just get something free, you know. Yeah. Um, uh, it's, it's Parenting is getting more and more difficult because of our society problems. Heard a, uh, a grandparent uh, being asked by a, a senior who's graduated from high school waiting to go into college uh, for money so they could go out and have a good time. And, you know, my first thought was McDonald's is hiring. They're going to offer a $100 bonus. Mm -mm. Doesn't work. Doesn't work. My oldest grandson, who's 12, has gotten now where he'll say, you got anything I can do to earn a little money? Of <laughs> course, he knows he's going to get off the pay. <laughs> yeah. Well, let's pray then. Father, we thank you for today and for what we can have in Christ, the freedom to serve righteousness, for you are righteous, and we give you worship. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Brother, did you see my email?